Um, yes, like as Sean said, I, we have a one month old at home, so I haven't slept in a month. Um, I tried to finish this talk on the plane, but I fell asleep. Um, so we'll just, we'll, I'll do my best. Um, but I think probably the, the first thing, and maybe the most important thing I'll say today, <clears throat> it's really good to be home. Um, I was flying into Edmonton and looking out the window, and I was remembering a time nine years ago um, where I was flying back from Nigeria. I'd gone home in Nigeria to visit my parents, and I was coming back to school uh, to start my fourth year. And they're like, flight attendants, prepare for your descent in Edmonton. And I felt like I was arriving home to Edmonton after four years of not really feeling at home. Um, and it's kind of weird that, you know, well, not kind of weird, actually. It makes so much sense that I'm coming back, and I feel like I'm coming home. And part of what makes it make so much sense is just, like, looking ar around in this room. And, like, yeah, I came to this place as a 17-year-old who, like, thought he was very smart but was actually very naive um, <laughs> and fell in love with making art. Like, I didn't really make art when I was a kid, but I think many people in this room, like, helped me fall in love um, with that and it changed my life like it really it really has so thank you um, thank you very much and it's really 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 good to be here hey, hey. Um, okay so this talk I'll try to talk about my practice and what I've been doing since I left this place um, and the way I'm sort of gonna try to uh, I'm gonna show different bodies of work and try to use it to talk about some core things that keep coming back in my practice, starting like from 2018. Um, and there's sort of two phrases that I think kind of help locate much of what I'll talk about. So if you forget anything, if things don't make sense, just sort of return to these things. So the first is <clears throat> this beauty as a strategy for survival and a precursor to thriving. This is sort of like something I stumbled, I like arrived to in grad school, like, this sentence while I was like pulling out my hair, writing my thesis paper, and I wrote this sentence and I was like, ah, this is it. Like this is what I'm, I'm this is what I've been coming to this whole time. And a large part of it is based off of this graphic that a friend who was a nurse sent me um, during the pandemic. Um, during the pandemic, at the start of the pandemic. <clears throat> and it sort of is this movement from feeling in crisis, and it sort of describes the you know, symptoms, uh, moving to struggling, moving to surviving, and moving to thriving. And the one thing I like about the graphic is the back and forth and how you're sort of moving in between these states. Um, and something that I'm curious about is what, what things help us move between the states um, or what things make us move between these different states. Another phrase or another sentence or yeah, is this one by Hilton Owls um, in a, an essay called The Garden. And he says, what is it about flowers that no matter where they're grown, in death camps or by the sea, in private homes or on the border of war zones, why is it they keep on flowering while insisting on their right to inspire feelings in us that we can barely know or articulate in all, in all our truth and terribleness? So my practice is sort of invested in thinking through the garden or using the garden as a, a sort of productive space, a productive metaphor for thinking through um, life in a very general sense. Um, for me, it's sort of the garden is situated as a space of like productive contemplation. It becomes a, a, a space of possible sanctuary. Um, my interest in the garden started, I would say, yeah, in 2018, 2019, with two projects that were happening simultaneously. And uh, I'm going to talk about them. And one thing that I think I'm learning now that I think I was being taught when I was in school was the fact that oftentimes you, um, actually, I think I had a good conversation with April Dean about this. Um, oftentimes, you have to make work to understand what it is you're making the work about. and you don't necessarily know why you're doing a thing, and it's, it's in hindsight often. You're like, oh, that's what this work was about. Um, so one of the first serious projects I would say I worked on was in 2018, I got 
funding from the Edmonton House Council to work on a project that I called The Valley. It was a, like a, it was a photography-based project where I was going into the River Valley and documenting uh, shelters that were built by people um, living in the River Valley and making sanctuary spaces for themselves there. My curiosity around the River Valley emerged because in my first few years in Edmonton, I just was drawn to that space. I would spend a lot of time walking there, sitting by the North Saskatchewan River, listening to the water. Um, and you spend enough time in the River Valley, you start to see these signs of life that people are living there. And for me, this sort of like, maybe call it a loss of innocence, um, but it kind of rocked my world because moving from Nigeria that's like often described as a third world country and coming to North America and the first world, I made a lot of assumptions about like how, I guess the simple way to say it is like how much better things would be, um, thinking about the sort of like legacy of colonialism in Nigeria. Um, and moving here, I didn't really know about Canadian history and the fact that the same legacies persist. Um, while working on this project, I found myself really just sort of like, I don't know, like I guess in, in pain with this tension of like being in this place that was so beautiful and had so much potential, but then there was this revelation of like, I guess this other side of community when there seems to be a lack of care. Um, where people sort of are pushed to the margins or exist in the margins and it seems like the city just sort of moves on. I think maybe when I, I, think when I started this project, I, I was like, you know, you make art and you change the world. Um, and as I was making the project, it became very clear to me that I didn't know what to do. Um, and you know, thinking, preparing for this talk and coming back to Edmonton and actually just walking around Edmonton and reflecting on the news and things that are going on in Edmonton that are very palpable right now. Thinking about this project just sort of like brings me back to the fact that I think we often make work um, as a way of thinking through the world we live in and we don't necessarily know what it does um, and you know can it change anything? Can things change? But one thing that I think was really sort of already starting to happen for me was recognizing that I I, what, what seemed to be more important than making the work was to show the work in a way where a community could gather and sit with the work and be held in a space of care. Um, and thanks to um, a, uh, not April Dean, Amber Rook at the Works Art and Design Festival, um, Amber really trusted me with this project um, that we did in 2018. And it was called In Search of Eden. And really the Eden here was sort of like, or the, the phrase In Search of Eden was me sort of coming from Nigeria, looking for this utopia that doesn't exist, thinking it was Canada, and realizing, yeah, it, it, it doesn't exist anywhere. The, the, the thing that's sort of significant about this project and why it keeps kind of coming up for me in my work and thinking about situating my practice currently was A, like the desire really was to make a space, instead of just showing the photographs as these objects that were removed from the context in which they were made, um, but to sort of create a space that could, in a way, um, evoke the context. So we had a large, these like large scale photographs, a light box, um, there's an image that kind of shows what the light box was like at, at night. Um, and we created a, a living wall of plants that are native to the Edmonton River Valley. Probably the most significant thing about this project for me was every time people would come into the installation, almost immediately people would comment about the, the plants and people would want to know who's watering the plants, who's taking care of the plants, how are the plants surviving? And I feel like the, what people were really thinking about was how do we create a condition where the plants can actually thrive? Um, and not just sort of survive the duration of the exhibition. For me, this sort of question is significant because if we, like what happens when we extend that? Like if we think about this desire we have for plant life to thrive or plant life to, to, to be in a condition that sustains it, what happens if we extend that to community? Like what? what things do we need to do in order to create systems that help communities thrive. Um, 
around the same time I was doing this weird thing where I would just like take photographs of people's gardens as I was like walking by. I was living in Queen Alexandria and people had just wonderful sort of front lawn gardens and I started this sort of almost like impulsive practice of documenting other people's gardens. I didn't really know why I was doing it. I was just sort of like looking through my phone and it's like, oh man, I have all these pictures of gardens and people are like, don't you take selfies? And I'm like, no, I don't. I just, I just stalk other people's gardens. Um, something that sort of became clear to me, I would say probably in like 2020, so yeah, a couple years later was this idea that at the same time as I was making these photographs of the river valley and really seeing the conditions people were living in, seeing the ways that people were making spaces for themselves, sanctuary spaces, spaces where they could thrive, um, but also sort of wrestling with like how hard things were and like it was really heavy for me to be, to be making that project. I think I impulsively started documenting flowers as a way to sort of like take care of myself while I was working on the River Valley project. Um, one sort of person that kind of, I, I read this book in, I think, 2020, and it started to help me think through, or it started to help me understand what was happening. Um, so this is a book, Gardens, an Essay on the Human Condition by Robert Poe Harrison. This book, in, in the book, Harrison traces multiple histories of gardens to identify the reason for their prevalence across centuries. In doing so, he concludes that gardens have existed precisely because they represent a distinct human impulse towards a vocation of care. So he's sort of like, why have people been growing gardens for so many years and through all conditions of human life and all sort of societal stuff, people keep cultivating these garden spaces? Why? And he's, his theory is like, there is an innate desire in humans to care for things. Um, one of the ways he does that is he recounts this Roman creation myth, and I'll read what he says. So he says, once when Care was crossing the river, she saw some clay. She thoughtfully took up a piece and began to shape it. While she was meditating on what she had made, Jupiter came by. Care asked him to give it spirit, and this he gladly granted. But when she wanted her name to be bestowed upon it, he forbade this and demanded that it be given his name instead. While Care and Jupiter were disputing, Earth arose and desired that her own name be conferred on the creature since she had furnished it with part of her body. They asked Saturn to be their arbiter and he made the following decision, which seemed a just one. He says, since you, Jupiter, have given its spirit, you shall receive the spirit at its death. And since you, Earth, have given its body, you shall receive its body. But since care has first shaped this creature, she shall, she shall possess it for as long as it lives. So with this retelling, Harrison effectively situates a desire towards acts of care, be that for oneself, be that for the natural world, or be that for one's community, as a primary human drive. Harrison then goes on to say, human-made gardens that are brought into and maintained in being by cultivation retain a signature of the human agency, care, to which they owe their existence. However, Harrison acknowledges that any talk of care that fails to address the reality of the human propensity towards violence and forceful exertions of will would be naive. There's a part where in the book Harrison says, the garden speaks of human modes of order where man is master, subduer, and transformer, and concludes, we have seen that where man is master, subduer, and transformer, he is also slave, victim, and martyr. So this book was kind of transformative for me because it sort of situated the garden as this place of, of tension. Um, similar to what I was experiencing while thinking through um, the work I was making in the River Valley. On the one hand, really beautiful, but on the, other, on the other hand, this place that reveals the human propensity towards violence, uh, marginalization, inequality, inequity. Um, so when I went to grad school, I started making work that was trying to hold, like, I was trying to make this tension palpable. I was like, is it possible to make images that, in a way, yeah, that sort of like that somehow have this sense of like beauty and fragility, 
or like beauty and and yeah, beauty and hope, but also the sense of like fragility and violence or longing, um, or something that is unattainable. And so I was making work on concrete panels. I was making work on uh, tarps thinking through materials that would have existed in a garden, but then using them to make these paintings that would then get distressed, um, and then the image would sort of be removed. Um, and it was, it was interesting. I think some of this work was really nice and evocative. Um, one of the last pieces in this sort of body of work I made were these two paintings uh, called I've been, thinking of, I've been Thinking of My Mother's Garden and I've Been Thinking of My Father's Garden. Um, these were the first paintings that kind of like became probably like speculative fiction in a way. The previous paintings were images of people's gardens and I was just sort of painting them and using the process of painting to abstract the image and create a, a painting that had an affect or like uh, evoked something. But with these paintings, I sort of was thinking about, yeah, like, you know, the, the one of the effects of, um, colonization, marginalization, inequality, and equity are the fact that like not everybody not everybody gets to cultivate um, a space that is a sanctuary space for themselves. Um, I was thinking about my parents and like how much work they had to do for me to be able to stand in front of you guys today. And my dad, we always had this sort of we have this part of our property where it was just sort of like clay, dry, like dusty, um, but it was really good for playing soccer. But my dad would always talk about how he was gonna plant a garden there. And I was like, don't ever plant a garden here because I, I play soccer here. Um, but he never had the time. Like he just never actually had the time to cultivate that space. And so I made these two paintings based off of photographs of other people's gardens, but trying to imagine like what, what might they have done if they had the time? What might they have done if they had the resources? Um, and so, yeah, so these paintings were sort of made like uh, oil paints on canvas tarps. And then I would take a, a power sander and like basically try to like erase um, as much of the painting as I could. And then I would come back and like amplify parts of the painting. So I was making this work that was really trying to talk about beauty or like hold space for beauty, but also using these sort of strategies that were quite violent and quite aggressive in the making of the work and trying to create work that had this tension. Um, and then the summer of 2020 happened. This was a summer that was marked by heightened uncertainty due to a global pandemic that emphasized structures of inequality, boiling over into racial tensions sparked by the killing of people of color in Canada and the United States, and further intensified by the hateful rhetoric of racist individuals. During the summer, making art seemed extremely futile. I don't know if anyone else <laughs> felt that, but it's just sort of was like, what, what the fuck is a painting going to do um, at this point? Um, and I. Even though I'd been making work about gardens, uh, thankfully with some friends, and I think my wife probably called people and was like, you need to get him out of the house. Um, <laughs> but some friends were like, hey, we have some space that you can grow a garden in. And so I started gardening for the first time and I bought a little French easel. And, and in Guelph, there's a space called the Guelph Arboretum, the sort of this large expanse. It's like fantastic. And so I would go and I would sit out and make these plein air paintings that are really bad. Um, but very quickly, it like was really it, it quickly dawned on me that it wasn't really about the painting anymore, um, but rather it was about the experience of my body being in these spaces. It was about the experience of like looking at beautiful light, beautiful color, beautiful plants, and how while I was doing this, it was like the only time during the day that I wasn't thinking about the news. It was the only time I wasn't on my phone scrolling through social media and hearing another thing, another thing, another thing, another thing, another thing. Um, and I feel like this is how I was able to survive um, in that season. And then in the fall, we got access to our studios and it was like, get back to grad school, you're an artist. And I really struggled for a while, like I made some really bad work. Um, and finally just sort of realized that why I was struggling being in the studio was because I didn't want to be in the studio. I wanted to be in the garden. I wanted to extend my time in the garden. Um, so I was like, okay, well, what if I start to treat the studio as a garden? 
What if I start to treat the way I make work as a, as a process of gardening? And so I printed out a lot of the photographs that I'd been taking um, and started making these collages, thinking through the images that I'd been taking of other people's gardens as sort of a form of like collaborative gardening where the images became seedlings. And then I used them to create my own sort of fictional garden spaces that I could then sort of get lost in, in the studio. Um, and this was like a really productive time for me. I found that the process of collage mimicked the experience of moving through a garden. The collages reflected the dynamic spatial organization present in gardens. You know, the oscillation of attention experienced in a garden when you're looking at one thing, but really the thing you're looking at is being heavily influenced by, you know, the heat that's coming from the sun or the sounds you're hearing, or the thing you're looking at is brought into being because of what's happening in the background. Um, so this, the collages became a really kind of productive way for me to get back into making work. Um, so yeah, I made a couple of these. Um, and one of the artists I was thinking about a lot at that time was Hervin Anderson. Um, I don't know if folks have seen Hervin Anderson work. Hervin is a, quite known for his paintings. Um, he has like the barbershop series and like the grill paintings. But he has these amazing collages. Um, and one of the things that struck me about the, his collages was the sense of like the multiplicity of perspectives that were similar, or if, if, like the multiplicity of perspectives in the images sort of evoked this sense of moving through a space or trying to pin down a memory. Um, and the, the work just sort of had it embedded in it. Um, the other person I was thinking a lot about um, is Bonard. Um, uh, yeah, I, I used to hate Bonard. Um, I was like, this is just like candy. Like, it's not serious stuff. Like, you know, you've lived through two world wars and like the colonial project is going on all around you and you're making these pretty images of gardens with bright colors. Yeah. Um, and I saw, I'll, I'll show an image of a painting that kind of like changed my life, but I saw a Boyne Art painting at the Art Gallery of Ontario um, and it like stopped me in my tracks and I was like, wait a minute, there's something going on here, um, formally initially. And in reading, up, reading a bit more about Bonnard, I read this beautiful essay by a French art historian, Isabel Kahn. It's called The Mechanics of Happiness. And in this essay, she, one, would like, pointed out why I was interested in Bonnard on a formal, formal level. Um, in a similar way to Hervin Anderson, she talks about Bonnard's compositions and how it is sort of like almost cut and pasty. She says, some of Bonnard's compositions almost seem to be transcriptions of a snapshot, the, the materialization of ephemeral moments either directly experienced or related by someone else. Um, so I was like, okay, there are formal things happening in Bonnard's painting practice that kind of relate to this thing that I'm trying to get at of trying to evoke the garden. Um, but on a deeper level, um, Isabel Khan talks about how, or sh she talks about how a lot of Bonnard's paintings are, were from photographs, from memory, and also just imagination from, imag his imagination from what people had told him. Because starting around 1910, um, Bonnard's partner was dealing with severe depression, which led to him living mostly in isolation. And even when he would travel, he would travel mostly for like treatment and work from hotels. Um, and so there's a really beautiful line in the essay where she says, Bonnard cultivated fictions of boundless lyricism to forget his secret, his secret sorrows. His paintings radiate an optimistic vitality, but his daily life had little in common with the hedonistic, tender, amusing, and enchanting images of his canvases. She concludes, till the end of his life, Bonnard continued to distill the elixir of happiness through the bright and optimistic visions that he needed, well, that he needed in order to live. So there's something here that I was like, oh, like, these paintings aren't just candy. Like these paintings are someone's intentional decision to make art that they need to see in order to live, in order to exist. Um, this is one of the last paintings Bernard made. Um, if you had shown me this painting 10 years ago, I'd have been like, ew. But now I'm like, aw. <laughs> 
This is the painting that changed. This is the painting that changed my life. Um, I saw this painting at the Art Gallery of Ontario, and like looking at the painting felt like the experience of being in a garden, and, you, and you're sort of you move from like under like a shaded area, and you're standing outside, and the sun's in your eyes, and it takes like 10 seconds for everything to sort of start to reveal itself. That's what this painting does. Um, when I first saw it, I was it, so the painting is called Garden in the Afternoon with Two Children. And I, I saw it, and I, I, I'm pretty sure I saw this child, and then I was, like, was walking by, and I was like, wait a minute, there's another child. And then I think I saw this child. And I was, like stood there looking longer. So you see this child, you see this child, and then Sneaky Bonard, there's like a little child, like a third child there. And, and so there's something, there's something that was really striking for me about like, him making a painting that asked you to just take time, like just stop, be present, and look. And as you look, as you paid attention, things start to reveal themselves to you. The, the, the experience changes. So in the show at the AGO, I have like a little Bonard tribute. Um, so this is my painting called Room for Two. And there are like two chairs. I'll spoil it for you. And there is like a third chair hiding. So I'm hoping people will be like, ah, oh, two chairs. Wait a minute. Um, but yeah, after making the collages and thinking about Bonard, I was able to start painting again. And in the fall, I met this wonderful woman named Sylvia, who I told us, like, I'm a grad student in Guelph, and I'm making work about gardens. And she was like, whoa, you got to come check out my garden. And she like, invited me to the back of her garden. And yeah, I photographed Sylvia's garden quite extensively and just had lovely conversations with Sylvia. And it's like, one thing you will, if you're a gardener, if you garden, if you grow plants, if you know gardeners, they are very generous people. And it's one of the things that sort of like speaks to this like, yeah, tremendous thing about us human beings. Um, hopeful and generous um, and willing to share. Um, so this is probably, so this piece is in the, sh is in the show um, at the AGA, uh, at the AGA, yeah, and was sort of like the piece that started like making things make sense for me. Because at this point I was like, oh, like, what I think I'm interested in doing is making work that tries to make the garden experience palpable. Um, and more than just sort of making the experience palpable, invites the viewer into this place where they can be held for a moment. Um, so there's that. A lot of this talk about beauty and making space to hold the viewer and held for a moment. One thing I was really wrestling with at the same time was just like how frivolous that can sound when like shit is happening um, and like real things are happening and like injustice is happening and this is how I felt about Bonard I was like shit's happening you're painting gardens um, but one person that really helped kind of shape how I started thinking about the sort of necessity for moments of beauty and necessity for investing in moments of beauty um, is the American writer Elaine Scarry in the, her book on, on beauty and being just. So I have a couple quotes. So in this book, um, Elaine Scarry addresses the, the concern of you know, thinking about the garden, thinking about beauty as a form of naive escapism. Um, but she argues for a contemporary understanding of beauty as, a as a necessary component for addressing issues of injustice. For Scarry, beauty's utility lies in its ability to provide a space of productive reprieve in the face of overwhelming injustices and in its prompting of an attentive care towards matters of justice. So for her, the main criticism against beauty um, is what she, she terms the problem of lateral dis disregard, which is if I pay attention to this, if I pay attention to this beautiful thing over here, then I'm not paying attention to things that I should be paying attention to, which is injustice. Um, where is it? Okay, so the problem of lateral, lateral disregard. But she calls for a contemporary understanding of beauty that values a cultivation of attention that is caused by an experience of beauty. For Scarry, this cultivation of attention is a necessary precondition for any conversation about care or social justice. So one of the quotes in the book that I really love was, she says, there is no way to be in a high state of alert towards injustices 
to subjects that, because they entail injuries, will bring on distress, without simultaneously demanding of oneself precisely the level of perceptual acuity that will forever be opening one to the arrival of beautiful sights and sounds. How will one even notice, let alone become concerned, about the inclusion in a political assembly of only one economic point of view, unless one has also attended with full acuity to a debate that is itself a beautiful object? How, in turn, will one hear the nuance even of this debate unless one, also makes a, unless one also makes oneself available to the songs of birds or poets? So in this book, Scary really is like one of the problems that we have as a society is because we've trained ourselves out of, of, of experiencing beauty. And for me, it's, I kind of extend that into like, if we can't really like make time to experience the beauty of a plant, how do we experience the beauty of each other? Um, about this problem of lateral disregard, which is if you pay attention to beauty, then you're ignoring uh, injustice. She says, if I was about to place a vase on a, wide si on a wide safe ledge, and then finding one more beautiful, I consigned the first vase to a careless spot, we might have a case. But it seems more likely that the concern demanded by the perfect vase or god or poem introduced me to a standard of care that I then began to extend to more ordinary objects. So if I see a vase and I'm like, oh wow, this is really beautiful, odds are I see another vase and I'm like, because I've learned to notice beauty in the vase, I might be able to see the beauty in another vase. So this is sort of how she gets around this problem of lateral disregard. The other person that was really significant for me, and still is really, um, is Ross Gay. So in 2020, as I was making paintings outside, I made an intention to read this book by Ross Gay, American poet and gardener, Ross Gay, and it's called The Book of Delights. If you've not read this book, please read it. It's, it's fantastic, um, especially, in, especially in these days. Um, I'll just read the sort of his preface to the book and as a way of situating what this book is, because I think he says it best. So he says, one day last, Ju last July, Feeling delighted and compelled to both wonder about and share that delight, I decided that it might feel nice, even useful, to write a daily essay about something delightful. I remember laughing to myself for how obvious it was. I could call it something like the Book of Delights. I came up with a handful of rules, write a delight every day for a year, beginning and ending on my birthday, August 1. Draft them quickly and write them by hand. The rules made it a discipline for me, a practice, spending time thinking and writing about delight every day. Um, he talks about things that he um, talked about, he wrote about often. He said, I often write in cafes. My mother is often on my mind. Racism is often on my mind. Kindness is often on my mind. Politics, pop music, books, dreams, public space. My garden is often on my mind. It doesn't take me long to learn that the discipline, or it didn't take me long to learn that the discipline or practice of writing these essays occasioned a kind of delight radar. Or maybe it was more like a, develop, a development of a delight muscle. Something that implies that the more you study delight, the more, the more delight there is to study. A month or two into this project, delights were calling out to me, write about me, write about me. Because it is rude not to acknowledge your delights, I tell them that though they might not become essays, they were still important, and I was grateful to them. Which is to say, I felt my life to be more full of delight, not without sorrow or fear or pain or loss, but more full of delight. I also learned this year that my delight grows, much like love and joy when I share it. So this book was significant for me because it was such an, intense, an intentional decision by Ross Gay to turn his attention not away from, but because of the reality of violence against the black body that was so, that was sort of the conversation was so rich in the US and for us in Canada too, to sort of be like, you know what, I'm gonna pay attention to delight. Um, and this, this notion of developing a delight muscle. One of the other parts of the book that really sort of drives us home is, um, has anybody here watched The Wire? The TV show The Wire? Ross Gay talks about how, you know, in, in popular media there's so much um, unabashed violence against the black body. Um, 
And The Wire is sort of one of these characteristic shows where it's just like so much violence and like it normalizes it. It just sort of normalizes it. There's a line in the book where he says, I have no illusions by which I mean to tell you it is a fact that one of the objectives of popular culture, popular media, is to make blackness appear to be inextric inextricable from suffering and suffering from blackness. It is to conflate blackness and suffering, suffering and blackness, 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 blackness and suffering, suffering and blackness. Which is clever as hell if your goal is obscuring the efforts, the systems, historical and ongoing, to ruin black people. Clever as hell if your goal is to make appear natural what is in fact by design. I felt like that was also a really good example of describing what a garden is, to make appear natural what is in fact by design. Um, but Rothgate doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop at this you know, emphasis on blackness and suffering. He says, and the delight. You have been reading a book of delights written by a black person, a book of black delight, daily as air. Um, for me, this seemed like a really good example of strategies that one develops to move from being in crisis or struggling and surviving into thriving. So the work that I, I okay, I gotta look at time here. The, a lot of the work that I've been making since is really just thinking about that, is cultivating these spaces, um, my own sort of fictional garden spaces, um, for them to function as spaces that can hold the viewer in a space of possible beauty, um, possible care, um, in an attempt that I can move from a position of uh, surviving to thriving, and you know, hopefully my viewer can too. Um, one of the, uh, so the, this piece is there, and I, actually why I wanted to show this piece was, um, in this work I was like, even it's this fictional garden space, but this body of water for me was sort of a call back to thinking through um, my love for the Edmonton River Valley um, and the sound of running water. And so one of the other things that is in the show are these um, ceramic bird baths that I made, really just because I wanted to hear moving water in the space. And you know, I was like, what would Roy Mills do? I was like, Roy will make a fountain. Um, Roy wouldn't just play an audio. Um, and, but also just like thinking about like how does one extend the space of the painting? Um, oftentimes I, my wrestle with painting is sort of, is sort of, it becomes this world, it becomes this window that you can choose to go into or not, but how do you sort of like extend that space out into the viewer's space? And so this became a strategy, this, the fountains are sort of a strategy of doing that. Um, a couple more images of them. And I really wanna get to, I really wanna get to this. Something that I'm showing as well uh, uh, in the AGA show are uh, two um, suites of etchings. Um, and I really wanted to show these etchings because of Liz Ingram. Um, and really the printmaking department at U of A. Um, I say that because when I moved from Nigeria, I was like, yeah, art, drawing, <laughs> painting, sculpture. And then sculpture was full, and then I got enrolled in this class called printmaking. I was like, what is printmaking? <laughs> Never heard of it. Um, and took this class um, doing, a, what was it? We did Sintra, we did relief on Sintra and woodcut. Um, and yeah, when I say I fell in love with making art, I think it was really there that it started to, it started to happen for me. Um, and so oftentimes I will describe myself as a frustrated painter um, because really all I want to be doing is making etchings. Um, and so there, there's this body of uh, etchings in the, in the show that I'm, I'm really excited to be showing them. Uh, how are we doing for time? Huh? Should we skip to questions? No, okay, keep going. Okay. <laughs> 10 minutes? 10 minutes, 10, min 10 more minutes, okay. Another body of work I really wanted to show um, is this one. Um, I'm sh we're showing this painting in the AGA show, but this installation um, I, I was recently at uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Toronto, and it's sort of like everything I've said so far and thinking about spaces of care and the garden as this poten potential space of sanctuary. Um, 
sort of in addition to that, something that is on my mind these days is, I guess, this another phrase that maybe I should have put at the beginning. But what does it what does it look like to imagine the possibility of a good future? Um, what does it look like to invest in the cultivation of an imagination around the possibility of a good future? Um, and that was really what the show was sort of. This, this installation was trying to think about. So there's this painting um, of uh, a bird bath in the sort of like expansive garden space and lots of sky. Um, I don't know if I, uh, the image is coming up, but I was really thinking about uh, Caspar David Friedrich's um, Monk at the Sea. Um, I'll show the painting. So yeah, there's the painting. And then in the space, there's this wallpaper of, of clouds. And then on, the, on these pedestals, there are these small ceramic birds that I had made. And the clouds are sort of like thinking about, you know how like when we're young and hopeful, and maybe some of you still do it, but you look at clouds and you see these shapes. You know, you see these things that aren't there, but there is, you know, in your imagination, it might be possible that there's a hat, there's a bird, there's a plane, there's, you know, whatever you think is possible in there. Um, and there's this sort of hopeful, it's this hopeful activity, right? Um, and yeah, so that's, that's the clouds. And then the birds um, are sort of like in their birds that are painted in the, in the painting. Um, and then there are birds that exist in the space. And I was thinking about this idea of like, you know, if, you, if the viewer suspended their disbelief that the birds that are painted in the painting could have come out into the space and landed in real, the real space or in, in the physical space, and the birds that are in that are on these pedestals could potentially have flown into the paintings. And there is this idea that if we if you suspend your disbelief, there could be this transformation of states. There could be this movement between um, spaces that seem impossible to move from. Um, a large part of why I was thinking about that uh, was reading um, was listening actually to a podcast um, where Dr. Anna Elizabeth Johnson talks about this. You know, interview process she had where she would ask people like, "Okay, can you, like, what is your vision of the world that you know is headed towards disaster, disaster, sort of climate disaster, political disaster, socioeconomic disaster, uh, relational disaster?" And people had very vivid images um, of like, "Yeah, here's what's going to happen: like, more floods, more disasters, more this, more that." Like, people were really able to express what it would look like. And she would then ask them, OK, now what if we get it right? What does the world look like when we sort of are able to address these things? What if we get it right? And oftentimes people, would, people had no, they, they, they didn't have an image. And she, she then goes on to say, like, how are we supposed to move towards something that we can't even visualize? Um, how are we supposed to run into this dark abyss, even though the dark abyss is like what we want? And so what does it look like to invest um, in the possibility or in, in the imaging or imagining the possibility of a good future? It's something that I'm thinking about um, these days, I, it, and it's sort of what is driving work that I'm, I'm making now. This is the Caspar David Friedrich painting I was talking about, Monk by the Sea. Um, I'd always seen this painting in images and like like uh, like uh, you know in class or in textbooks, and it just seemed like a very gloomy, sad painting. And I was like, bro, I was depressed. <laughs> like, you know, like the 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 figure is so small, and there's like just doom like all around. And then I actually got to see the painting in real life, and I was like, oh, this is a very hopeful image. And as I was looking at the painting, two people came up beside me. And one of the people were like, oh, this is a very sad painting. And I was like, no, it feels quite hopeful. And why would I call this hopeful? For me, again, it's this idea of like possibility. Like There is this fog. There is this thing. There is this intense uncertainty. But what might come after? And I think I often tell myself, well, obviously, it's doom and gloom. But the reality is I actually don't know. Um, and is it possible that it might not be, you know? And it, it kind of has changed the way I see um, this, this painting. Um, one of the cool things about the, 
uh, work at MOCA um, was I had a really great conversation with uh, Christina Battle. Um, and um, we sort of recorded ourselves talking about just a lot of the stuff that we've been thinking about, um, stuff I was thinking about in relation to the show and stuff she's thinking about in relation to the work that she's making. And so it's still on their website, um, even though it says December 31, 2023. But if you want to listen to a really cool conversation, it's there. And there's also like a, a we put like links to like essays we've been reading and you know the podcast that I was talking about with um, Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson. So that's there. How are we doing for time? I should probably stop now. Yeah, okay, I'll stop now. <laughs> yeah? All right, great.